What's up, fam? Welcome to the On Deck Circle podcast, powered by FantasySixPack.net. I am, of course, your host, Dave Eddy, and you can find me on Twitter at Corporal Eddy. As you know, this podcast goes along with my popular dynasty rankings over there on FantasySixPack.net, and you can find them updated every other Sunday. In between those rankings... I will be updating this podcast as well to discuss those rankings and answer some of the questions that I get in regards to it. So if you have any questions about the rankings, um, by all means, drop me a comment either on the article on fantasysixpack.net, on Twitter, or you can find it on Reddit as well. So by all means, do that. I definitely love to get the questions and and get those answered for you guys. Uh, This is definitely one of my favorite Parts of, you know, being on Twitter and Reddit is, you know, answering answering those questions for y'all. So, um, one of the things we're going to do here today um, is not quite so much about the rankings, but kind of a continuation from last episode um, where we were talking about um, the Dynasty One Stop uh, 30 team uh, industry mock draft that we were doing uh, that has been finished now. And we are actually going to be kicking off the draft officially um, for the real deal. Uh, I believe it's going to be tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. But I think we're opening up the draft um, this afternoon at some point to go ahead and get some untimed picks in. Just because everyone's kind of chomping at the bit and they want to get going. Uh, I've got the ninth pick in that draft. I uh, got that through the invisible hand that we were doing um invisible hand was was quite interesting um on its own basically what you're doing is um you're you're bidding on your preference for draft order so positions one through 30 but you're bidding the number of keepers that you would lose in the future so we've got um 55 roster spots that we're doing for the draft so for example i bid I believe it was um, four keeper spots um, for the ninth pick. And so what that means is at the end of this upcoming season, um, I will not be able to keep four players. And then two years down the road, that gets cut in half. I won't be able to keep two. Three years down the road, that gets cut in half again. I won't be able to keep one. And after that, we've got a full roster. So we had a whole variety of strategies in regards to the invisible hand I think the winner, um, well, not the winner necessarily, but the guy that got the, the number one pick, which, you know, obviously is typically the most coveted, even though that was not my number one preference. Um, he bid, I think it was, it was over 25. I was either 25, 26, or maybe it was like 30 spots um, just to ensure that, that he got that. Um, my strategy was a little bit different. I, I, did, I did bid on those spots, but... My number one preference, like I said, was 9, which is what I got. And my second preference was 10th, and my third preference was 8th. And I did that specifically because I wanted to try to target a player that wasn't at the very, very top because I knew it was going to be very difficult to get at least a top 3 pick and you know, probably very difficult to get a top 5 pick or vice versa, the bottom of the draft as well. Um, it's something that's you know popular. People like to be on the turn, obviously, as opposed to in the middle. So... I specifically was looking for, you know, the ninth, 10th pick um, to target someone very specific. I would love to make mention of who that is, but I know that the guys in the draft will be listening to this, and I don't necessarily know that in the first round someone would go out of their way to snipe someone. Um, More than likely, they're going to, you know, pick their own guy, but, you know, obviously if I'm making a top 10 selection, the guy that I'm going to take is someone that everyone would love to own. So I don't want to influence those people picking seven or eight, you know, to kind of have my guy in mind. So um, definitely something I'll get into here once um, we record in two weeks. Uh, I'll be able to go ahead and, you know, discuss my picks. I'll, I'll get into some detail there because, I mean, that's exactly what these rankings are for um, in Dynasty League, you know. So we're drafting a crazy deep one. You know, we're, we're talking... 
30 teams, um, you know, 55 roster spots. So we're talking, you know, upwards of 1,500 players are, are going to get drafted. It's, it's going to be pretty wild. Um, for me, I've got a pretty decent prospect knowledge. So I'm comfortable at the tail end of that draft. Uh, I know that there's others that are a little bit more concerned. So I do think I have a slight advantage in the startup process, but, um, you know, not necessarily because just because you may know names and things about players does not mean that, you know, they will pan out as expected. So, you know, it's an, it's an advantage, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, it could technically be some sort of a disadvantage. But, um, you know, with this league, again, um, the mock, we did 30 players um, just because it was a mock and we didn't, you know, need to go balls to the wall. But we're talking about every starting position offensively. Um, that you would normally have so catcher first base second base shortstop third base three outfielders and then the you know utility guy we're doing nine guys um, on the mound as well so no um, positions there other than pitcher so you can have any combination of starters or relievers that you want and for the mock we had 12 draft or uh, 12 bench spots that we were drafting for as well it's similar to a five by five league but a little different um, so again just to recap um, the positions we were we were talking about here um, and are going to be in the real draft as well. Um, we're going home runs and RBIs, runs, stolen bases, and then where it differs a little bit, but what I like, we go on base percentage and slugging, as opposed to a traditional five by five would have average in that place. And then on the pitching side of things, um, we're going quality starts and K's, wins, ERA, saves and holds combined, and WHIP. So. A little bit different than a five by five because we're adding holds to saves and of course we've added the quality start so that's going to bump up you know your value on starters but at the same time because we're combining saves and holds you know that kind of way broadens the reliever um, pool as well but you kind of have to do that in a league that this deep because if you're talking about you know only having saves uh, you know it it, it becomes to the point where you're hardly going to you know, be rostering a whole lot of relief pitchers. You're going to be rostering them to try to vulture a win, uh, or more likely you're going to be trying to just get good ratios and try to get you know guys that are going to throw some innings to get just some, some strikeouts. But you know, with the mock, as I talked about last week, um, my strategy was a little bit different than normal. Um, normally I, I end up being a little bit more um, of what you know people will call a tricycle guy where – I am drafting much younger than the average person would, so um, much earlier on prospects, mostly. I mean, everyone's, you know, going to prefer somebody like Fernando Tatis, you know, that that's super young, um, over, you know, you know, your Nelson Cruz's and stuff. Um, but for me, it was more a matter of sticking to, you know, as many major league guys as really I possibly can. And, you know, avoiding going with those prospects. And it was hard. But, you know, that's part of the reason, you know, that, you know, we like to do these mocks. Is it does give you a chance to kind of work on things. And it's not like, you know, I was drafting crazy. Um, I was still going a lot of off my rankings. But, you know, there would be times where I would gloss over some prospects that I had higher ranked to go ahead and to get some major league guys. So, in the last episode, we, we kind of detailed the first five rounds um, right now here for this. I'm going to go ahead and just go five rounds at a time as a big chunk um, and just kind of get you through the draft. So what I'm going to talk about is, you know, my, my, my biggest personal standout pick and then what I thought was the most interesting pick by somebody else. Now, again, we're going five rounds at a time here, so 150 picks um, you know, in this, in this chunk. So, you know, it, it was a lot to look through, but I wanted to pick out something that, that I thought really stood out to, to my eye, um, that I wanted to discuss. So for me personally, um, uh, the, the sixth round, I went with Roberto Ozuna. Now he is a young closer, of course, who is not likely to lose his job anytime soon. And he's actually someone that I was targeting, uh, because I wanted to get help in the save category with someone that I felt very comfortable with in the future. Normally, dynasty leagues, especially startups, 
relievers are not somewhere that I target at all. The the save position or you know the save category, you know, the closer position is very volatile. As much as I think pitching is volatile, you can, you know, ramp it up even further when you start talking about relief pitchers. So that's not usually something that that I chase at all. But you know, I, I was really a big fan of the prospect of owning Ozuna just because, you know, he has elite ratios. And like I said, I don't see him losing his job anytime soon. He's been, you know, an elite closer. And he's someone that I think I can rely on. The reason I, you know, decided to talk about this pick in particular is because in retrospect, I would not have made this pick. Um, so here's a little PSA for everybody. Um, and you would think that I would not be the one that would make this mistake, but read the rules before you start drafting. Because I, even though I talked about it, did not quite realize that it was a saves hold league. I, I didn't realize we were doing hold. Um, and how I didn't realize that, I, I don't know, because like I said, we've talked about it, I've seen it, but you know, earlier on in the draft, I had Ozuna as the guy that I was trying to determine where I would take and so when it got to the point of you know he'd been the top guy on my board I, I pulled the trigger on him and a few minutes later I, I'd realized what I had done so you know Ozuna's still like I said an elite option um, but greatly lessens the value that I thought I was getting on him so I don't necessarily regret it but if I were to go back and and pick again I, I would have went a different route I think um, picked by somebody else that I found very interesting, uh, seventh round, um, 190th pick, uh, dynasty one stop. That's Nathan who was on the last episode. Uh, he took Brendan Rogers. Now Brendan Rogers is a guy I have 135th in my rankings. So obviously I love the value here. Uh, he's getting him, you know, over 50 spots better than, than I have him ranked. And I still seem to be, you know, one of the higher guys on Rodgers at this point. So many people are down on him after that dismal debut he had in 2019. But again, it's a very small sample size. I, I absolutely still believe in him. And he's got the Coors advantage um, as well. So, uh, you know, he's definitely a guy when we do the real draft. Um, here, maybe starting any minute, really. Um, maybe I'll be able to get a live pick in on the air here. We'll see. Um, but he's, he's a guy that I'll definitely be having in mind. I, I think that... Um, you know, I'm higher, like I said, than, than most on him. So I, I may end up pulling the trigger on him. We will see what happens. Um, rounds 11 through 15. Um, pick for me that, that stood out the most was in the 12th round uh, with pick 354. I'm going to butcher his first name, but um, I took Artidis Aquino, um, outfielder for the Reds. Very high risk, high reward type player. Uh, was definitely... Uh, out of nowhere that he came basically for 2019, uh, the performance that he put up. And it's more a matter of, is this a sign of things to come? Did he figure something out? Or, you know, is this just a flash in the pan? I took him here because he was a you know tremendous value, in my opinion. Uh, like I said, I got him 354th overall. He's ranked 192nd on my board. The only reason that he sat for so long is outfield, um, as I mentioned last episode, was a spot that I was really focusing on. And so my starting off field was already locked up. Um, but that's part of the reason why I, I did take him when I did. Uh, is because I don't think that you know he held the same risk for me that he would have for others because my outfield was filled. So by default, you know he automatically goes into my utility spot. If he you know was more of a flash in the pan it, it's not so bad um, I can fill him with you know re replace him with anyone from my bench um, if he you know is that huge power guy that you know we've seen in 2019 then you know I've got four incredible outfielders so you know I I felt like it was well worth it and the value was obviously there in, in my opinion pick from somebody else I found interesting uh, 11th round uh, I was with pick 310 again uh, Nathan at Dynasty One Stop on Twitter, uh, he took Nolan Gorman. And uh, Nolan Gorman is one of my biggest prospect crushes. Uh, personally, I have him ranked 130th in the rankings. Uh, so to get him at 310 to me is, is quite a steal. And he is definitely an example of my thought process in this draft of going after. He's 
definitely an example of me going, you know, with win now type guys because obviously I like Gorman a lot more than Aquino, um, but Gorman didn't, you know, fit what I was going for. So he wouldn't have made it this far, um, you know, if I wasn't going for such a win now. Um, now myself and others have started to sour on Gorman a little bit. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily fair. Um, just his profile is something that um, as time has gone on, I've gotten away from a little bit. Um, kind of looking more towards, you know, guys that are a little more well-rounded. But, um, I mean, I still love Gorman. And he definitely still has, you know, that Joey Gallo type upside. And, you know, uh, again, great pick by, by Nathan. Uh, rounds 21 through 25. For me personally, um, you know, now I was able to start diving into prospects. I had my, my, my major league roster um, completely filled. And I was going to go ahead and just, you know, start to make a huge prospect run. Um, and so that was really the first pick where that really came into play. Now, I already had drafted Noel de Marte fifth overall, or not fifth overall, but um, with, with my fifth pick. So I didn't completely ignore prospects. Um, you know, I, I just couldn't pass up on Marte at that point. But this is my, my next prospect drafted. Um, so 21st round, pick 607. Um, I took uh, Luis Toribio. Um, I have, he's a um, third baseman for the Giants, um, for those who aren't aware. Now, I have him 428th in my rankings, and he is one of my favorite under-the-radar prospects. I don't think that this is a guy that a lot of people are in on. Um, he's very young, so, you know, it's not surprising. But the, the bat speed that this kid has is just absolutely elite. I think that if there was a 2020 minor league season, he would have skyrocketed up people's rankings once, you know, they, they got to see him on the field. I really think he has a chance to be, be a pretty special hitter. Um, 21st round, uh, Reese White. Um, Chris Bubik was already off the board, so he couldn't go there. Um, but he took another guy that I love. Um, he took Tanaj Thomas. Again, that's a, that's a prospect I think um, would have been in for a big year. Um, you know, had we had a, a full minor league season, I, I definitely see him being a guy that would have jumped up the rankings too. Uh, Tanaj Thomas was somebody that was definitely on my list. Um, I just was looking more at bats. So um, I didn't end up getting to the point where I was going to pull the trigger on him, but a uh, hell of a pick by, by Reese White there. And then final five rounds, 26 through 30. My favorite pick came um, in the 29th round. It was pick 847, a name that you all will know, uh, Aaron Sanchez. Now, I've got him 490th in my rankings. So, um, you know, him falling all the way down to 847 was great for me, but I can totally understand why. This dude has been a, a walking injury. Uh, now, if he's healthy, and granted, that is a big if, I, I definitely think he has... All the makings of a top 75 uh, dynasty starting pitcher. Uh, I mean, like I said, when healthy, this kid is this kid is good. We we've seen him at his best, but unfortunately, his his best just doesn't seem to last very long. So I thought it was well worth the gamble to go ahead and pull the trigger on him, guy that you know I could sit on the bench and you know wait to see what happens in 2021. Now, with a deeper roster as opposed to you know this mock, which like I said was only 30 teams. And we're going, you know, twice that here. Um, I don't think that Aaron Sanchez probably would fall quite so far because you have more room to stash him on the bench. But I will definitely be keeping my my eye out um, for him as well and maybe some others. My favorite pick that was not by myself uh, was in the 26th round. It was pick number 722. Um, Michael Waterloo on Twitter uh, took Diego Cartea. Diego Cartea is absolutely my favorite um, catching prospect in the game. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, he's the best talent-wise because obviously he is not by any means at this point. But I will put the upside of that guy's bat against absolutely anybody. Now, he comes in, unfortunately, um, at 666 in my ranking, so that is a little bit concerning. Um, but what's more troublesome than that is he's got Will Smith and Kiebert Ruiz ahead of him in that Dodgers system right now. Now, I think Cartea will be an impact bat um, at the major league level as a catcher. It just may not be for the Dodgers. I, I don't know what they're going to do with those three guys. Uh, obviously, Will Smith is there and, and doing well now. 
Uh, Ruiz is also a prospect, but you know um, he, he's he's a little bit further along than Cartea is. But at the end of the day, I think Cartea um, quite dramatically has the best upside of those three. So I don't know if Smith or Ruiz will get traded, or Cartea gets traded, or you know somebody you know like Ruiz doesn't quite pan out. I, I don't know, um, but I think that of those three, Cartea is is going to be the guy. So, quick recap um, of my team, at least. Um, I mean, all in all, I liked my team. I mean, obviously, I, I think, you know, you'd have to have a lot go wrong um, to end up having a team that you didn't like. But, I mean, like I said, I built this very much win now. Um, and that caused me to shy away from my rankings a little bit uh, just because, you know, I was bypassing prospects to fill, you know, starting roles right off the bat. So taking a guy like Eric Hosmer at 247th overall or Colton Wong at 294 overall were not picks I would typically make. Um, the Wong pick, honestly, I, I did not hate. I actually you know, was pretty happy with that pick, but Hosmer was a tough one at 247. I, I actually sat there and I thought about that one long and hard. And that, that was one where um, I did not want to take Eric Hosmer there, but... I was in the need for a first baseman. I had let that position slide, and there wasn't really much after Eric Hosmer that I liked any better than him. So if I didn't snag Hosmer at that point, I, I don't know exactly what I would have done. Um, to be honest with you, at that point in time is when I was really looking hard at Gorman. Ugh. But... Um, I, like I said, I, it, was, it was hard because I was intentionally not going that route. Um, I, I would have loved to have taken Gorman at that point, and I went back and forth between what I was going to do. And finally I said, nope, stick with the, stick with the mock draft strategy, take your medicine, take Hosmer, and just you know see how it goes. And that's what I did. Now, you know, it, it, like I said, it was just quite hard um, to, to do that for me. Uh, but it was a good exercise because – I know that I'm not going to be full-blown win now whenever we do the real draft, but I also don't think I'm going to go as prospect-heavy as normal. But to be honest with you, it's really going to depend on how the board falls. I think in a perfect world, everyone that's in this draft would draft for win now. I mean, there might be one or two guys. I mean, we're talking about 30, and we're talking about 30 guys who know their shit. You know, but there might be one or two who are going to go into this saying, nope, I'm going to, you know, fill the major league team because, you know, I have to, of course. But I am focusing on trying to win two, three, four, five years down the road. And that's cool. I, I get that. Um, you know, I would never go that prospect heavy. But, um, you know, I think most people have given the opportunity, you know, the board fell correctly. They would draft for win now. So we'll see what happens with my strategy. Like I said, I'm going to... Probably head into it with more of an eye to win right now, but um, you know I'm a I'm a prospect guy at heart, so you know we'll see how the board falls. It it'll be interesting to see exactly the difference between the mock and the real draft. I think that you know people will draft a little bit differently. Um, I know that, like I said, for myself, I didn't draft precisely like I would in the mock because I, I did want to get a little bit of practice at going more win now while still, you know, following the ranks so that it wasn't skewed. But we'll see exactly what everybody else does, you know. Um, one thing I did not expect, though, um, and it kind of came along with having to pass on prospects, is um, I end up uh, having a big run kind of in the middle of the draft on starters. So I didn't intend on doing that. Um, I do like to build a, a fairly balanced team. Now, granted, I will almost exclusively... Um, you know, be more hitter heavy, but I think everybody is. But I did plan on being more balanced as well as, you know, building for that win now. But man, the way the board fell to me, it was just bat after bat after bat after bat that, that was the best pick for me. So I had a run from my 13th to my 19th picks of nothing but arms. And to be honest with you, I, I think I built a, uh, built a pretty decent rotation there's a lot of risk in those arms, 
Um, so I'm definitely going to keep that in mind, you know, when I do my, my real draft, I might have to force myself to take a picture here and there, but, um, you know, I, I, I like how it turned out. I don't, I would, it would have been curious to see how well my hitting was able to hold me up. Um, cause this is a roto league and it would have been interesting to see how that pitching staff, you know, worked out. If everyone stayed healthy. I would be in pretty good shape, um, but there's a lot of question marks that, that were in there while all you know good big league talent. So, so it'd be interesting to to do the real draft. Like I said, here it's gonna hopefully start for us here uh, in the next hour or so. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and I it, doing that is going to be really good for this podcast too. I I really want to get in depth with my thought process for for these picks. You know, I, I hear a lot from people who say, well, you know, these dynasty rankings uh, that people do are, are bullshit. Nobody follows these whenever they do a real draft. Everyone's, you know, everyone puts these prospects up so high and nobody would really take Wander Franco in the in the top 20. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I took him 22nd overall in a Fantrax um, league that, that we had done. You know, some people think that's high. Some people thought that that was right on. Some people, you know, would have taken them sooner than that. So, you know, it really depends on who you are, what you're looking to do. And, you know, if you have the confidence to to go with a prospect so early. No, Wander is obviously, you know, a different kind of prospect. He's the number one prospect in the game. And so taking him super early, you know, that that's justifiable. But, you know, when you start talking about, having a guy like Nolan Gorman at 130th overall, you know, it does take some stones to pull the trigger on him here in this league. You're looking at, you know, fourth or fifth round pick to, to get Nolan Gorman. If you were to get him solely based on my rankings, just blindly not taking anything else into consideration. So one thing that, you know, I point out in the rankings themselves on the site is that, you know, every league is different. So, you know, this league has got on-base percentage and slugging. A lot of leagues still have um, average. Some of them um, just do OPS, which is on-base percentage plus slugging. Um, You know, we've got quality starts in this league. Um, Saves and holds are mixed together. So, you know, the, the point of it really is every league is different. So no single, you know, ranking of any kind is ever going to cover all the bases. So in mine here, um, it's, you know, meant to be a, you know, a painted with a broad brush, you know, just kind of, you know, this is how I like guys. This is where I, you know, value them compared to each other. Now, an on base percentage league and an average league are very different. Um, there are some guys that excel at one and are not so great for the other, um, and vice versa. So, you know, it's, you really can't use any one set of rankings unless that set of rankings is specific for the exact type of league that you're in. So, you know, keep that in mind as, you know, you not just only look through my ranks, but look at others. Um, some people, you know, look at it differently. Some of them also will be a little bit more real life relevant than fantasy relevant. So my rankings are much more, well, not much more, they're entirely fantasy relevant. So relievers and catchers are drastically downgraded for me uh, because they're not I don't I don't find those positions nearly as valuable now in real life a catcher is damn important um, but not so much in fantasy um, you know they just don't get enough plate appearances typically uh, and that's really not what they're there for they're not, a catcher is not there solely for offensive production as you know maybe a a first base a third baseman typically is so you know something to keep in mind is you as you flip through not just my rankings but others they're meant to be a guideline you know they're just the feeling of the writer's thoughts about that individual's value compared to others and it can drastically change you know um you know a guy like you know joey gallo let's say in a league where on base percentage and slugging our categories is much more valuable than if we did not have those categories and we simply had average. So if you were to look at my rankings, in reality for this particular league, a Joey Gallo or a Nolan Gorman 
um, is going to have more value. So um, I think that that will about wrap things up for this episode. Like I said, um, in about two weeks, depends on how fast the draft goes. Maybe I will put one out next week as well. Um, I will definitely update my rankings next week. Um, speaking of my rankings next week, I guess it would have probably been something I, I could have led the show with to say that for right now, my uh, dynasty rankings do not include um, the 2020 draftees. So Spencer Torkelson, Austin Martin, uh, Asa Lacey, Emerson Hancock, uh, you know, all of these guys and, and more will be included in the next update. So next weekend, um, you can go ahead and, and log in, check those rankings out, and you'll be able to see all of the draftees as well. Um, that's going to obviously take a little bit of time. It's going to you know, force me to look at the rankings as a whole um, because I obviously have to figure out where I'm going to slot these guys in. And so that'll you know cause me a lot of reflection on the rankings. So you may see more changes in the rankings for next week than typical. Uh, just because it's going to be a really good time to sit back, refresh the rankings with all of these draftees in there. So um, I think it'll be a really good update. And then um, I will definitely talk about that a little bit at some point here in the near future as well. Um, because, you know, first-year player drafts are, are huge. And, you know, these draftees are, you know, obviously a big part of that. The J2 signings, I don't know when those are going to happen. I'm going to take a stab and say it doesn't look like it's going to happen here in a couple weeks in July. Uh, I believe MLB is allowed to push that all the way back to January. So if that is the case, um, you know, those guys obviously won't be in the rankings until they are at the bare minimum signed, but um, it, it takes a little bit more than that as well. Uh, so that may be an off-season thing before we get, you know, all of the J2 guys in there um, as well for, you know, a, a first-year player draft rankings uh, all said and done. But, you know, MLB draft guys, like I said, they will be in there on the next episode, which very well may end up being next week. Um, so next week's pod could very well be part of, um, you know, going, you know, pick by pick here for what we've done in this startup dynasty, as well as uh, maybe the first part of, the MLB draft guys. So with that being said, guys, um, I hope that you enjoyed the little recap here of the mock draft. And I hope that you're excited to follow along with the real deal because all 30 of us, including Nathan, who's not even in the damn league, but is running it. Um, we're all very excited. We think that, you know, we're doing something very special, very unique to go so deep and to go with 30 owners um, and guys that know what they're doing as well. So, well, we're really trying to, you know, put something together here that, you know, that, that that's a pretty big deal. So um, I hope that you enjoy following along. You can definitely follow along uh, with each of my picks. I'll be posting those on Twitter with a detailed as I have characters um, recap of, of my thoughts on that pick. Um, so I hope you guys look forward to checking that out as well. But with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here and I will... Um, I will talk to all of you guys next time.